Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is a journalist and writer, a columnist. He's had his books turned into films. Um, he's made documentaries. But his new work is this. It's called Empire Land by Satnam Sangera, How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. And it's a really interesting look at the history of empire, everything that we're not taught at school, and how it could change the way we view our country today, the attitudes we hold, and the current culture wars that we are living through. In the past, he's written The Boy with the Top Knot, which was turned into a movie which explored his own childhood and family circumstances. And he writes very amusingly in the Times newspaper at the moment about having his adult nieces living with him since the start of lockdown. Satnam Sangera, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Ways to Change the World. Now, the book subtitle is How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. I wonder whether it could be rewritten as How Imperialism Has Shaped Satnam Sangera by Modern Britain. Well, yeah, actually, that's a good point. Um, I start the book from the point of view of someone who knows almost nothing about empire. I mean, it's, it's incredible when I look back at my education. I mean, we were talked about all sorts of things to do with the, the world, but empire never turned up. We had endless Remembrance Day services, and it didn't occur to the teachers to go, oh, actually, you, your ancestors were there too. I mean, you're a racially diverse student body, but your ancestors, ancestors fought in their millions for a country that colonised them. And even when we studied things like, say, the potato famine in Ireland, it wasn't compared to the famines that were going on at the same time in India. And it was almost as if they, our teachers went out of their way to avoid mentioning empire. I don't know if your experience of education was similar. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think all of our experiences were very similar. I mean, you know, we had a very, you know, Anglo-centric history curriculum and talk of the empire was all within or through a certain prism. And, and I, you know, I, I sort of, I, I, I feel a lot of resonance with a lot of your writing because I get a sense of, a guy who sort of escaped his past pretty quickly by doing very well educationally and going to Cambridge and becoming a writer and becoming this metropolitan, urbane, clever guy who then kind of wanted to rediscover where he came from. Yeah, it's weird that we're not friends because my hobby is collecting Asians in the media. Yeah. And we don't know each other. And I grew up watching you. I don't, know, don't want to make you feel old, but um, I remember watching you on Newsround. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess the sad thing is that you and I are still kind of rare examples. I mean, I still haven't, don't meet people like me in the media. And when we started, it was even more difficult, especially if you're a working class kid trying to break into Fleet Street. It was really hard. And I don't know how I did it. If I'd known the facts, I don't think I would have tried. Why'd you say that? Because when you look at the odds, I mean, they're really against you. When people ask me for advice on how to get into the media... I'm just like, man, I would think about something else maybe. But the thing is, if you want to do it, you're going to do it anyway. You don't need my encouragement or your encouragement. That's almost what means that you make it the desire. You know, it's, you can't fight it. Well, I mean, tell us then about your childhood. I mean, you, you've written extensively and you've revealed so much about yourself through The Boy with the Top Knot. So let's just start for, for people who haven't read that or seen it on TV or, or know anything about it. Your parents came to this country in the late 60s. So what was your childhood like? Yeah, they came in 1968, which was the year that our local MP Enoch Powell was making his Rivers of Blood speech. And that speech, people forget, was largely inspired by his fear of the Sikh migrants like my parents, that they wouldn't integrate. And um, they were, I guess, they grew up, I grew up in a ghetto and was, everyone was Punjabi. Only our teachers weren't. It was incredibly working class in the sense that all my uncles my grandfather were working in factories. I was working in a factory, you know, for up to 90 hours a week during holidays. I think the extent of my ambition was to work maybe in a bank, you know, and that felt really exciting because I'd be one of the few people in my family to have a white collar job. My life changed because I got a sort of scholarship to Wolverhampton Grammar School and I was the only one of my siblings to do so. And it just set me off on this alternative trajectory really. And I ended up at Cambridge and then... Here we are. And did you go to Wolverhampton Grammar because they pushed you, because they said, look, you've got to do as well as you possibly can? 
or was that from you? They encouraged me, but basically it was two particular teachers at my primary school who adopted me and uh, got me into the school. I mean, the fees, the one term's fees at that school were more than my parents earned in an entire year, you know, and it was actually the Sisty Places scheme, which Margaret Thatcher came up with. That got me a place. I mean, that's sort of unusual then in, in, as an immigrant story and that a lot of people will always say, well, it was their parents who were pushing them to make the best of the opportunity that they had created by coming to this country. Actually, that sounds like it was, it was you and your teachers. I think my parents wanted me to do well, but you can only dream as far as you can see. And there was no role model. I mean, I, my most successful person I knew in my family was a bank manager. So therefore, I wanted to be a bank manager. They wanted me to do well, but equally, they didn't want me to leave Wolverhampton. And so when I got into Cambridge, they were happy for me. But my dad's response was, why can't you just go to Wolverhampton University? Because they, there was no tradition of um, sons leaving their families. And so I really struggled with guilt for years. And then there was a struggle about getting married. But you know what? It all worked out. And I wrote that book to kind of confront them. And we love each other. And my mum, I, I think about the distance my mum has come. She's travelled a much bigger distance than I have, you know, from her background as a, as a daughter of farmers in India, you know, with very little education, to being the incredibly tolerant woman who doesn't mind her granddaughters wearing miniskirts and, you know, understands how to use Instagram. Her journey is incredible. And that's because... Um, and people will know if they've read the book, but but won't if they haven't. She didn't just have to deal with all the usual stuff of being a new immigrant and a relatively poor one uh, in this country, but but with a, a husband who had serious mental health problems. Yeah, my dad had um, schizophrenia, and that became evident, I think, as soon as they got married. And uh, it's not comfortable to talk about, but he was you know, he was violent towards her, and this was before I was born. He ended up in prison for a short time. And then my sister also developed schizophrenia. So that is a really difficult thing to deal with. And I think about how my mum not only survived, but she rescued them, both of them, and then raised four kids. And then, you know, basically got me into Cambridge and loved me enough to let me go. And I just think she's, she's like Nelson Mandela. It's like a superhuman feat. We all love our mothers. I think because of the book, I know loads of strangers love her too, because it's such an incredible example. Her bravery is like off the scale. Are you, are you able to say that, or were you able to say that to her just one to one? Because it's it's um, you know you're very lucky to be able to say that in public, and you have done in previous articles and in print. And sometimes it's a bit easier to do that in front of other people. You know, it's easier to thank your parents when you're making a speech at a birthday than it is to do it face to face when it's just you. Totally. I think that's a combination of an English thing, cringe, and also quite a Punjabi thing because Punjabis don't dwell on their feelings. Before my, I wrote my book, I, didn't, I couldn't find a single Punjabi memoir. They don't deal with feelings. They do stuff. So it was difficult, but I've done it, like you said, inadvertently, not only through the book, but I've taken my mum along to events and she's besieged, you know, from all these people who are amazed at what she's achieved in her life. Now, this latest book, I mean, is a really brave thing to take on because you know people are going to attack you from every side aren't they? and say you don't know what you're talking about why have you why have you come at it yeah it's already it's it's already crazy man i, I mean there's so much abuse but i just think we, we as a country we have a really strange relationship with the british empire and it's a combination of kind of selective amnesia and nostalgia and the amnesia, amnesia comes from the fact that we basically don't think of ourselves as the country that had British Empire. We see ourselves as the country that won World War II. And then the nostalgia, I think, comes from the fact that this idea that you can balance things, that you can balance massacres against railways in India and come to a conclusion about whether empire was good or bad, which is a really absurd idea. And I don't think it really exists in any, any other country. I think my argument of my book in Empire Land is that it's much more useful to think about the legacies because the legacies are living things, you know, and these you can actually weigh up overall, whether they're good and they're bad. I think overall, we are really dysfunctional about our legacies from empire. Yes, I mean, we, we certainly seem to have a need to come down on one side or another on absolutely everything at the moment, because politics is so polarised. And what everyone is saying about your book is that it's, 
it's nuanced and I mean not balanced, but it's it doesn't seek to come down on one side or another. It just you, you've you've done a lot of research and a lot of reading and pointed a lot of really interesting things out. Yeah, I guess a lot empires in the news every bloody day. I mean, when I started writing this book, it was quite an esoteric subject, and by the time I ended it, Black Lives Matter had made it a, a kind of subject of daily news. It was on the news at 10, you know. But I'm glad you say that because that was my mission because I basically wanted to write the book I wish I'd been given at school. I, I find it amazing. It, it took, took me to the age of 44 to work out really basic things. And the most basic thing is multiculturalism. The reason you and I are here having, having this conversation today is that we had a multicultural empire. And... The dominant narrative of my life is the idea that black and brown people came here almost uninvited and took advantage of the British. But actually, what the narrative is, the British invaded a quarter of the planet and those people then came here, often as citizens. And this is the thing I didn't realise. Windrush, a lot of the people on the Windrush were coming to Britain without jobs. They were coming as citizens because the 1948 Nationality Act made them citizens. I think that narrative has been completely forgotten and that's why we have such strange conversations about multiculturalism and race and it's true the immigrant communities have a duty to integrate to learn English but also I think the host community has a duty to remember why we came and why we're here we, re we came here often to rebuild Britain after World War II or we came here as citizens and, and people thought that they would be more welcome. I mean, I know my own dad tells me about how he was a doctor and he qualified and his ambition was to go to the United States. Um, but my mum's dad, who was a doctor in the Indian Army, persuaded him to come to Britain instead because he felt that the links of empire and of British India would mean that they were much more welcome in Britain and much more comfortable culturally than they would be in America. Yeah, I guess, and it didn't really work out like that, did it? I mean, I guess one of the arguments I make in my book is that uh, tracing the influence of empire is that the racism of British empire was echoed in the racism towards black and Asian communities in post-war Britain. You know, there was racial violence in the same way there was in India. There was a fear of mixed race relationships. I mean, every time there's a race riot in Britain in the 20th century, almost always seems to begin with a fear around of brown men dating white women or having sex with them, you know. Um, and then there was a colour bar. I mean, in British Imperial India, um, brown people and white people did not socialise with each other, did not integrate. And that continued in Wolverhampton, in Birmingham. I mean, there was a colour bar in working men's clubs in Wolverhampton until the mid-80s. And even now, I would say, there are certain pubs in the Midlands you go to if you're brown and certain pubs you don't go, go down to. But I guess the biggest surprise for me is was learning about racial stereotypes. I mean, we Sikhs see ourselves as uh, martial people. Actually, that was an idea partially created by the British because the Sikhs fought for the British during the mutiny of 1857. And they basically decided that some races could be trusted and some couldn't. And so they came up with the idea of the Sikhs being a martial race and even wrote handbooks saying we had the perfect sized nose and our, our eyes were spaced out in just the right way to be martial. And those ideas continue to be persistent today. How are you treated when you go to India? I mean, I, I often, because I'm often going to India for work and dealing with Indian authorities and the Indian government, they treat me as a British person um, or, or, and almost sort of as a, as a traitor. <laughs> You know, in, and, and so I get all the sort of the resentment of being a British journalist and few of the advantages of being of Indian origin. Yes, yeah, so no, that kind of reflects my experience. I mean, they're not particular fans. I remember once uh, trying to talk to someone in a train station and he spoke to me in Hindi and I understand Hindi but can't speak it. And I replied to him in English and he said, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just speak your own language? Are you trying to show off that you can speak English? I was like, shit, you just couldn't win. But I think that's the, I, I don't blame them for that attitude, given the history. But what is your identity now? Because throughout this conversation, you've talked about we, as in Britain. Are, are you unequivocally British in your identity? Yeah, I say automatically. I think you probably say automatically too. And I, I, when I, I did a Channel 4 documentary on Jalin Wallabarg, the massacre that happened 100 years ago, about two years ago, and I was surprised by the number of letters from people saying, 
oh, you said we. That's so surprising. And was, to me, it comes totally naturally. I am British, you know. And one of the more, most depressing responses I get to anything I write on Empire is that, oh, you know what? Why don't you shut up and be more grateful? Because you would have had a terrible life in India. And what that is, is racist because it's basically rejecting the idea that I am British. I'm not, I don't understand the phrase second generation immigrant. I was born here, I'm British. And I'm entitled to, to observe as many negative things I want to about my home country as my white colleagues, whereas they, do, they don't get told to be grateful all the bloody time. But do, do you therefore think, I mean, it's one thing to sort of be ignorant of cultural history and empire, but I wonder whether you think the British education system actually teaches you and even teaches us as Asians to be racist. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I talk about this in a whole chapter, the whole chapter on imperial psychology. And it was a thing in that one of the things the British did with Indian princes when they had defeated their kingdoms is they gave them a British education. So you saw it with the last descendants of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. He was brought over to Britain, became a friend of Queen Victoria, had a public school, converted to Christianity. But then later in life, converted back to Sikhism and realised what had happened to him. And I think I've had a kind of similar experience. But I think imperial psychology is something I didn't really realise was happening to me. But I was definitely colonised, you know, in that I was made to look down on Indian things and I was made to value Western forms of literature and thinking over all Asian types. And as you say, I mean, you know, sort of once you'd already started writing this book, then the whole thing of sort of the Windrush scandal and Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and everything that flows from that has happened and sort of dominated um, the news in all sorts of ways. How, how did you feel watching that? And did you feel that that was exploring your culture as well you know do you think asia has been a, a sort of excluded from that narrative at all it felt like being a fan of a really obscure musician like i don't know chesney hawks and then so suddenly he has a number one hit you know these were things that only existed in my head and suddenly they're on the news it's exciting but it's also scary and the problem is it's accelerating the end interest it's not only that it's in the news every day there's a culture war that's been started by a right-wing sect of the Tory party against empire. What they realised is that you can start a culture war over empire and it plays very well in focus groups. So the best example is Robert Jenrick, who in the week where it was revealed we have the highest deaths in the world from COVID, he wrote an article saying, we need to introduce a law to protect statues. Why did he do that? It's because... It plays really well because there's an idea in Britain that if you're proud of our history, then you're proud to be British. There's a connect, bizarre connection, which doesn't exist in, say, Germany, where you can talk about the Holocaust and still be proudly German. In J Japan, you can talk about kamikaze pilots and still be proudly Japanese. But it's a very British thing to connect 500 years of complicated history to pride. And it's it's become this accelerating culture war. And you see it also with the National Trust. You've got the Conservative chair of the Charity Commission saying the National Trust is going to be investigated for uh, veering from its mission. The way I see it, they're just doing their work. I mean, the, the, war, the war on woke, um, I, you know, I think is really interesting. And, you know, the, the ones that sort of surprise me are things like James Wong. When James Wong talks about racism and gardening, and people get absolutely furious about it instead of thinking, well, maybe there's something in that. Yeah, it's bizarre. I think what's happened is there's been some historians like Nar Ferguson um, and so on writing about how British Empire was probably better than other empires and wasn't so bad. But that has been taken to the, to the extreme view that British Empire was good and entirely good, which no serious historian makes that argument. No one does. I mean, Niall Ferguson acknowledges in his book all the massacres, the genocides. You know, he doesn't gloss over it. Jeremy Paxman doesn't. No serious historian does, but it's become a popular view that British Empire was not only good overall, but it was good always, which frankly, is no, it's, it's just not true. 
But I'll, I'll be sort of pussyfooting around a bit. I see in, America, in the American analysis now, people are being much more brave about saying what happened there was about racism and was about white supremacy um, in, in the Trump era. Um, we don't say that about Britain at the moment because we don't want to say that a war on woke is actually sort of underpinned by racism because that is to accuse quite reasonable and apparently decent people of being racist. Yeah, and that's a very good point. I think we tend to look at America and think, oh, they're much more screwed up than us about race. Look at them. What a, you know, what a mess. But actually, they're having serious conversations about reparations for slavery. I mean, Biden and Kamala Harris have talked about it, about the numbers that might be involved. And it's a conversation. But over here, we just stuck in this incredibly babyish view of our history. And it's just a simple fact that the British Empire was white supremacist in the 19th century by its own, just takes its, its own words. It was proud of the fact. But I think me saying that on, say, your program on this podcast is going to really trigger people. But do, do you think there is, there is racism underpinning the war on woke? Absolutely, in that it's, a, it's part of the culture wars, isn't it? It's teams, the footballification of politics. You pick a side and... It, their side is Brexit, pro-empire, be proud of empire and race. I mean, the thing is empire, the re- one of the reasons empire is such a hot potato is that it's almost synonymous with the race. You're talking about racial su- supremacy, aren't you? You're talking about white people conquering brown people. And you're also talking about difficult things such as nationalism, misogyny. That's why empire is such a nightmare to, to talk about in the media. And how have you found um, writing about this stuff in the Times newspaper, which is also sort of such a pillar of the establishment and, you know, fairly conservative as an institution? Yeah, it's been, um, I can't say it hasn't been full on (laughs) in that I just, I actually started to worry because I get so much abuse now, not just through the Times website, but on Twitter. And you probably get even more that I've stopped noticing it. And I think actually it's important you occasionally notice what people are saying, neg- negative things people are saying about you, because then sometimes they have a point. But now, I mean, people regularly get in touch with me and saying, are, are you okay? And I, I I don't know what they're on about because I just don't notice the abuse anymore. Um, I've actually been pleasantly surprised that the reaction to the serialization in, on the Times website has been not as negatively received as I expected. I would say at least a 40% were responses saying oh I didn't know about this I want to read your book and where where do you feel you sit I mean do you know do, do you feel you're part of the establishment now or are you an outsider I don't know how to I guess it's for other people to say that I would say are you part of the establishment I mean well I, I mean I think you know if, if you have a privileged position in the media you are part of the establishment yeah. but I think you can also but it's but also how you feel is different I've always felt like I was an outsider you know and and sort of feel like you know, I feel, I suppose, that I've, I've infiltrated the establishment and that's great. Yeah. But, you know, it's not where I belong. It's not where I ever expected to be. No, I, to- I totally feel like an outsider. I would say Rupert Murdoch feels like an outsider too, and he owns the paper, you know. And, um, yeah, and I feel like journalism is anti-networking, you know, because what I do essentially is I'm introduced to very successful people. I have to interview them, and then I have to ask them really aggressive, negative questions. And actually, you're going out of your way to upset people. I don't think my kind of journalism is what you do if you want to make friends. I, yeah, I just feel like I've, I generally, if I go to a party, I have to find out who's there first in case I've slagged them off a print. I more often than not have them. Well, let, let me just ask you briefly about your journalism, your, your journalism career then, because you, you've kind of, you know, you were a reporter on, on the FT and now you've become, you know, people think of you as a columnist or a writer rather than as a, you know, a straightforward news journalist? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend my career as a model because the way you make it is that you do one thing and you do it brilliantly, like you. I would say you do one thing and you're brilliant at it. And so you're nationally famous. What you shouldn't do is do a novel, a memoir, a book on history, a business column, which is what I do. I don't think my business readers have any idea I've written a novel. I don't think people who read my novel have any idea... I've written a memoir. You know what I mean? It's like, but what excites me is doing new things. It's like, I love that feeling at the start of a project thinking, this is beyond me. I haven't got the talent. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And then slowly over four years, managing to do it. 
And then eventually people saying, you did a good job. Well, except with Empire Land, I just expect people to kill me because it's such a poisonous subject. It's like you get to the top of the mountain. I know there's loads of people with daggers waiting to uh, stab me in the front. You, you, right at the beginning of this, you sort of talked about how difficult journalism was. Why do you feel journalism is, is a difficult path? You know, and is it because of everything we've been talking about and the sort of the inherent racism and white supremacy within it? Or is it for all the other reasons that journalism is difficult? I think it's mainly about class. And I think working class people don't know how to get into the media. And at the same time, middle class people really want to get into the media and they know how to do it. So you've got a double whammy there. You know, that's why it's dominated by middle class people. How on earth does a working class kid from Wolverhampton break into the London media? And the other thing is geography in that you've got to come over here. And so it's a kind of perfect storm of challenges. I think it's getting a bit better, but not by much. I mean, I, I chaired a, a charity that in creative access for a few years, which gets black and Asian kids into the media. And so I got a good sense of which media industries are good and bad at taking people from, you know, underprivileged backgrounds on. And I would say Free Street is the worst. Advertising is almost as bad. And it's particularly annoying because they constantly put black and Asian people in the adverts whilst they themselves are almost entirely middle class and white. But I would say book publishing is very good. And I would say TV on screen is pretty good too. I don't know if that's your experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would agree. But I mean, what, why do you think print journalism is so much worse than TV? I think it's because it's not regulated. There's no one telling you know, newspapers what to do. People are scared of newspapers. You know, there's no, there's no one telling our proprietors that they need to be more diverse. And the other problem is it has been, until recently, a declining industry. And so it's got enough problems, you know. It, it doesn't, hasn't got the bandwidth to worry about diversity when it's basically trying to work out how to survive. But I think that's changing. And so do you feel sort of hopeful about diversity at the moment? I do, because of young people. I feel like there's... With the Black Lives Matter protests, and I've I've had my nieces living with me um, during lockdown, and they're in their twenties, and they have such a different attitude towards race and empire. I mean, the way they see museums is the way that we used to see zoos. They can't believe they exist, and things like Black Panther, you know, they're just much more aware of racial issues and empire, and they get their history from all sorts of sources. And I just think they're more intellectually vigorous than we were. You've, you've written really amusingly about having your nieces living with you since lockdown. Since 1876. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you effectively a parent? But, but you've become a parent of grown-ups. It's weird. It's a weird relationship because there's actually not a massive age gap between us. I guess it's 20 years. And um, I really like that. I like the fact that I mean, you've got kids and they, this, hopefully, I suspect this is what they do, is they challenge you and they expose you to new ideas and they force you to think outside your box. And I, I have a wonderful life normally living by myself, but having them living with me has made me realise that I was getting too comfortable and I wasn't challenging myself. And sometimes it's good to have a terrible argument and to be forced to ask yourself why you believe the things you believe. I mean, they think I'm the most conservative man in the world. They think I'm Richard, Richard, Richard Littlejohn, basically. And they think I use terrible language and I'm not woke enough. And that's probably quite good for me. Well, I mean, has it made you think they've got a point? Yeah, I think they've got 75% of a point. But sometimes they're wrong too, you know, and I think sometimes they're too right on. What does that mean? How, how, how can you be too right on? Is it possible to be too right on? Or, you know, too politically correct or too woke? You know, is, aren't all of these things just kind of being polite? Yeah, I hate the way the word woke has been demonised. I mean, it began as a real issue in the black community. It was about fighting white supremacy and it's been hijacked by the right wingers as a way of describing anything they disagree with. But at the same time, I do sometimes think, think, think people can be too woke. I mean, for example, when I read about some of the things that Harry and Meghan are doing, I do think, Jesus wept, give it a rest, you know? Um, but... Equally, I probably think the same about right-wingers, you know. 
It's like political correctness. That was definitely taken too far. But fundamentally, political correctness was was about being kind and thoughtful. Did it go too far? I mean, where, where, at what point did it go too far? I mean, that, that's what I sort of... I mean, I've, I've sort of written in defence of political correctness in the past because, you know, I think all, all, you know, all the political correctness was sort of just born out of, you know, trying to be kind to people or trying to be considerate. But then people have always said political correctness gone mad. At what point does political correctness go mad? Basically, it goes mad whenever a right-wing newspaper finds an example. Because what happens is in any movement, there's people who take it too far then that, what they do is used to ridicule the whole movement. So, for example, Winterville, right? Renaming Christmas Winterville or saying season's greetings because you don't want to say Christmas. That is ludicrous. The idea that brown people are offended by Christmas, but some, some politically correct person got it into their head that they've got to get rid of the name Christmas. That was taking it too far, right? We, we end this podcast by always asking people how they would like to change the world if they could. Um, what would you do if you could wave a magic wand? I guess I'm going to say the thing that we've touched upon repeatedly is that we need to rediscover the ability to agree to disagree. I mean, I just never see that phrase nowadays. Nowadays, it's like, I've got to defeat my opponent. I'm going to report them to the authorities and get them arrested and destroyed. But no, very rarely do people say, I have a different opinion and actually we can agree to disagree. I think we need a return to civility and there's so many areas of controversy like empire, trans issues, race, where people have stopped talking. I've got friends who have fallen out over the trans issue and it's horrible. I mean, these are people who fundamentally agree about most things and yet they've lost the ability to talk because of this one issue. And I think social networking is largely to blame, but we that's the one thing I would like the world to rediscover is the ability to agree to disagree. But do you think civil debate is out of fashion because it didn't produce change? That's a good way of looking at it. I think it's mainly out of fashion because it's too easy to demonise your opponent on social networking when actually you don't even know who the person is, when you have a weird avi, you know, when you've just got Union Jack as as your Twitter avi, you know? We've... We don't think of people as people. We think of them as, you know, areas of code on the internet to destroy. Satnam, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me on. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. If you did, then please do give us a rating or a review so other people can find this podcast. You can also watch all these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.